every Tuesday they had uh, after school reading programs. And uh, one was here for the Latino kids and one for the non Latino. So you, you, I would get in every Tuesday in the line that I was told to get in. And uh, one day I broke ranks and I got in the white line. And you should have seen my own line, intentionally or unintentionally. They were saying, Ricardo, Tas Loco, Richard, you're crazy. You're yeah, in the wrong what line. What are you doing? This is our line. And when I got in this line, I was really, uh, I had a lot of fear. Because all the white kids turned around and was like, hey, the, you know, they were saying what they were taught. Their line's over there. Nothing, nothing me, just like, hey, you know, you're in the wrong line. Kind of, you know how kids do it. Right. And then I thought, well, you know what? I wonder if I can pass for being white. There was two beautiful ladies up there in the trailer. I remember blonde, blue eyes. And I kept thinking, are they going to notice that I'm not white? And really, I had, I had a fear that was unbelievable. But I had something inside of me that was greater than that fear. And when my friends were saying, what are you doing? I, I just looked at them and I whispered in a loud way, said, they have cookies inside. I'm going to get us some cookies. And the truth is, why did I get in that line? Why did I? Because sometimes you got to break ranks. You got to get out of that line you were told to get in. Because I was hungry. And I knew they had, that's all. I just wanted a cookie. I was hungry. And as much fear as I had, my hunger was greater than my fear. And that's why I tell people today, if you're hungry for that promotion, if you're hungry for that degree, if you're hungry to run for an office, fear will leave. Right. And when I got up there, guess what those two ladies did? They filled my pockets with cookies. Now, there's two morals of that story. One is hunger is the antidote to fear. If you're hungry, you'll never fear again. The other part of that story is that everyone needs to understand, and I mean everyone needs to understand that there's a cookie that's been baked just for you. Your job is to get out of that line that you were told to get into and get into the cookie line. For many of us, it means to get out of the uneducated line into the educated, the poverty line into the prosperity line. And uh, that's why I tell you, that's why uh, my success has been beyond my wildest dream. I really didn't know any better. All I had was I'm hungry. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Richard Montañez, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Rule number two, stand out. Many years later, my CEO said, you know, you're the only person in the company who can peel the potato, put it in a bag, load the truck, make a marketing strategy and sell it in the store. No one else can do that. And that separated me as an executive because, and you know that, because we knew what the front line was going through. We knew what, uh, what downtime was like, Hey, we got to get that going on. We knew what safety was. We knew all, you know, all that stuff, you know, and it gave me an advantage. So I learned all the equipment. And then one day, you know, um, one day, um, one the, uh, the operators, one of the operators didn't come in. So that meant that uh, what they would do is they would double up the two shifts to cover the one shift for four hours. So that meant the, the guy on graveyard, because that was my shift, he was going to have to stay till uh, 11 in the morning. And the guy on swing shift was going to have to come in four hours early and then do his eight hours. So it was, you know, 12 hour, 14 hour day. And this guy uh, had been doing, you know, the whole week and he, he was kind of tired because this guy was off for a few days. And, and I remember I begged the, uh, the supervisor. I said, let, let me have those, four, you know, four hours of overtime. Wow, that would be, you know, we'd be going to Disneyland that weekend, you know. And so I said, let me, let, me, uh, let me run that machine, you know. And they're like, you're crazy. What's the matter? You're not an operator. No, no, I've. You know, Ruben's been showing me, you know, when he goes on breaks, I'm, I'm giving him a break and what? He goes, yeah. And, and, uh, and, I, and at the time, I was writing everything down. I, I, I did terrible in school. But putting in, being put because in my realm. you're dyslexic, right? 
Yeah, yeah, right. But being in my realm, all that was, it made me as though I was brilliant. I could, I could solve math problems by saying, well, you know, we need 30,000 pounds of corn, you know, 20,000 gallons of oil. I need, uh, you know, six people to pack. You know that, right? And I was able to calculate where it was very efficient, where we were making money. So I, I begged them to, you know, let me do it. And, and sure enough, you know, I, I did it. And, and by this time I had, I had been tweaking stuff to, you know, see how this out. And, um, that day, the next day, the, 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 the main boss of production said, uh, who ran, you know, line number one in Doritos because, uh, that eight hours, you set a record for most pounds produced. <laughs> and they told him and said, what? A janitor said, use them anytime. I didn't have that official job, but I was, you know, uh, I was filling in for vacations. I was doing more of that than I was, you know, mopping. They could get anybody to mop, you know. And then uh, I really started uh, tweaking things and writing things down because when I started there, uh, they told you how to uh, how to make a Dorito. Okay. And then I started saying, well, you know, how do you make the best Dorito possible? So I was tweaking things and I was writing things. It's like a laboratory. I was writing things down like a pilot would. And I said, you know, I, I presented it to my, I took it home to Judy and Judy wrote it up like a presentation and I gave it to one of the supervisors. And he said, you know, again, you did this? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he shared it with the production man who shared it with the plant manager. And next thing you know, they're using those specs for the whole plant. And later on, it grew into the, into, the, into the nation. Rule number three, get an education. I'm telling you, get your education. Go as far as you can. Because if I can make it this far without an education, just imagine how far you can go with an education. Rule number four, release the limits. Young people, you need to know that nothing outside of you is bigger than what's inside of you. Go ahead, release the limits that have been placed on you and set free the unlimited life you and I are intended to live. We're all brilliant human beings and we all hold the gift of genius. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, be curious. I've said this before, you know, th there's so many statements out there that are incorrect. And, and one of them is I'd like to correct. And the statement is that uh, you get promoted by who you know. And that's not true. You get pr promoted by who knows you, right? who knows of you, who knows your work ethics, who knows that they can trust you. you. You could say you know the CEO of the company, but if he doesn't know you, you'll never get that opportunity. And trust you. And trust you. But see, I didn't realize that. I was just being me. I just want, I was just happy. I just wanted you know, everything that I could get out of life in my area. So when the time did come when they were having problems, you know, I, I started to learn uh, my whole industry, uh, whether it was my job or not, you know, I, I would uh, hang out with the, the guy that ran the machines. I would hang out with the guy that, that cooked the product and I'd say, teach me this. And I was just having fun. Rule number six, take the shot. The only thing that, I, that I'd like to tell young people is this, is make sure that you write your history down because um, no one were recording it because of who it was coming from because I wasn't an engineer, I wasn't a PhD, you know, research and development uh, person. So a lot of that history um, was never celebrated the way it should, should have been. So I'm teaching young people. I made it, that's why I wrote the book. You know, I wanted people to know the true story, uh, how I overcame certain things, but not to make the same mistakes I made. Get yours. So that's why I said, you know, young people say, well, I, I, I want to, I want a career just like yours, Mr. Montana. I said, no, time out. I never had a career. I had a calling. You know, um, the stuff that I went through, I don't want you to go through it. You know, but 
you know, I'm telling people, you know, now, you know, write down your history. Make sure, you know, because the people say it's a, a, not too many people will understand this. Uh, you know, we're always told that it's about the team. And yes, but sometimes it's about you. You know, don't, don't pass the ball. You know, Michael Jordan would never have been Michael Jordan if he would have continued to pass the ball. Kobe Bryant, my hero, I'm taking the shot. So I learned, you know what? The ball's in my court. I'm not going to pass it. I'm going to take the shot. So I tell young people, don't pass that ball. Take the shot. You know, and then they say this too. Now, I'm an old corporate guy, okay? Cause remember, I got years of, you know, in the boardroom and all that. It's just I, I'm looking back now on something we're incorrect. You know, I need, I'm trying to change the culture. I changed the culture in corporate America once. I'm trying to change it again. You know, um, so I'm saying, you know, there's an old quote. I don't know if it was Winston Churchill. Somebody famous said, you'd be surprised at how much you can get done when no one gets the credit. And I'd quote that like, wow, that's so true. But then I said, you know what? That ain't true. Somebody's going to get the credit and it's probably going to be your boss. Rule number seven, play by your rules. My revelation was simple. What would happen if I put Chile on a Cheeto? So I made my own. You see, when, when you hear that I invented, I made the seasoning. I'm a little bit of an artist. I drew the graphics. I did everything. And I also believed what the CEO said. I didn't know any better. Sometimes it's okay to be naive to certain things. Sometimes it's okay not to know the rules because then you got to play by those rules. Somebody says, well, you need to do protocol. Well, no, I don't want to know protocol because then I got to enforce it. Rule number eight, love yourself. I didn't know what our company was all about. I began to research it, found out we were a sales and marketing company. Then one day, destiny, because I'm a firm believer in destiny. I saw it. I just got a revelation of what I could do. So I did what any typical Latino janitor would do, is I called up the CEO. <laughs> This was many, many years ago. Remember when corporate America was a command and control? Corporate America had not seen the word empowerment yet. I believe, <laughs> I believe that I changed corporate America. I believe that I introduced the, the word empowerment to corporate America. Some people said, you're so full of yourself, Richard. I said, I am, you should be too. <laughs> fall in love with yourself because when you fall in love with yourself, there's a freedom. Rule number nine, do it with a smile. And the other thing that I never did, and I teach this, I never let anybody know what I was thinking. I was smiling all the time, even when I was upset, you know, because they would hold it against you. So it's just like, never let them know what you're thinking. You know, if they give you a dirty job, smile, you know, whatever. And, that, and that's what I did. And it worked for me. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is seek for a revelation. My CEO at the time had sent out a video. That was the communication during the time, the technology. He sent a video. Um, he, he told everyone there across the country, actually across the world, 300, I think 300,000 plus employees at the time. Um, we want all of you to act like owners. And you got to understand that was such a bold statement because that was during when corporate America was a command and control. Corporate America had not yet heard the word empowerment, let alone individuals. So he was basically saying, I empower you to act like an owner. Here's another thought for me was, wow, is he telling the truth? Is he, is, he's inviting the janitor to act like an owner? And so many people just, it just went, I said, don't you, didn't you hear what he just said? He said, we could all act like owners. So I, I went into action. I started, you know, researching my company and and then I asked the salesman if I could go with him on a weekend. I said, I'll load your truck up. So I went to the stores with him and I loaded the Frito-Lay products and just had a great learning the business, whatever I could. And I always say, you know, all you need is, as I said it earlier, all you need is one revelation. One revelation will lead to a revolution in your life. And what is a revelation? It's simply this. It's something that was there all along. It's just been unveiled to you. It's like this water's been here 
for an hour. But if it was hiding and I unveiled it, you didn't know it was there, but it's been there all the time. So you just need that one revelation. And I was looking, and this was many, many years ago, and I saw it. I saw. And here's what I saw. I saw no products that were catering to Latinos or to the person who loves spices. It was all pretty much, you know, salt and maybe barbecue flavored. Um, no one was selling you know, spicy flavored or anything hot. So I'm like, that was it. And I even looked at the salesman next to me and I'm thinking like, don't you see what I see? You're here right. every I'm day. I'm connecting these dots. Come on now. So he took me home and I remember I went home and I sat in our, on our porch and we have the old fashioned um, um, of steps, you know, concrete. So I'm sitting there and in my neighborhood, and a lot of Latino neighborhoods like mine that I grew up in, we have something that is called the uh, elote man. It's a vendor. It's a corn, called the corn man. And he sells uh, uh, corn on a stick, and he puts mayonnaise, butter, cheese, however you want it, lime, chili. And um, remember, I whistled, and I said, let me have two, you know, one for my son here. And I said, yeah, with everything, of course. So I'm eating, and I'm thinking, what could I do? What could I create? And then I looked at that, and it looked just like a Cheeto. And it was just like, like that, Jeremy. I thought, there it is. What if I put chili on a Cheeto? So I went to work, you know, and I actually made up my own seasoning, you know, all that, and put it on an unseasoned Cheeto. My wife took some to work, I took some to work, and everybody fell in love with it. And, you know, next thing you know, I, I, I called the CEO. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the good deed of the day. This is something new. I believe that you're built to serve and it feels so good to do something nice for somebody else. So good deed of the day, put down in the comments one thing that you need help with, that you're working on, that you'd love some support or guidance on, and then two, go comment on somebody else's comment and give them some love, give them some support, give them some encouragement, maybe give them some connections, try to help them solve that problem, even if it's saying, I believe in you. That one little bit of encouragement can be the difference between somebody quitting and continuing on. So the good deed of the day, in the comments below, write down one thing that you need help on, that you're struggling with, that you're working on, and then part two is go give love to somebody else in the comments too, and let them know that you believe in them as well. In those days, there was no emails we had phone books. You could find anybody who was anybody. So the first one was a CEO. So I got the, so what do I do? I went to one of the secretaries and said, hey, can I use the phone? Like, no, no, you can't use the phone. This is just for, well, it is. I'm going to call the CEO. And she's like, oh yeah, you can use my phone. <laughs> you know, one of those that, oh, he's going to get, you're going to get, I never seen anybody get fired on the spot. <laughs> so I called them up. And in those days, you know, we're in every country that the government will allow us worldwide. So only other CEOs call up our CEO. So the secretary says, uh, excuse me, his executive assistant who was a visionary and still my friend today, says, well, um, what country are you calling from? <laughs> United States. <laughs> You're the president of the, no. I work in California. She's like, you're the general manager of California? I said, no, I work at the ranch of Cook. She was, you're the director of operations? I said, no. She goes, what are you? Because I'm the janitor. <laughs> A visionary. A visionary. Young people, many times greatness will come in a ridiculous form. You've got to be willing to look ridiculous. Leaders, many times a great idea will come in a ridiculous form. Can you see it? She did. He gets on the phone. I tell him my idea. He says, I'll be there in two weeks. Hang up. Copiest man that you've ever seen. Wow. Didn't know what I'd just done. Here comes the plant manager. Somebody always in the room to steal your destiny. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Because see, the phone calls just came down the, hey, who's this guy that just, what are you doing? Because in those days, if you were anybody, you know, all the corporate jets flew in, right? This is, you know, many, many years ago. Who do you think you are? Oh, you're going to do the presentation. Everybody's coming. Now I got to fix everything. Now I got to paint the place. <laughs> so I remember I went home and I told my wife what I've done my whole career. I don't know what I did. <laughs> but now they're coming and, you know, we're going to go get a book on how to create a marketing strategy. Don't worry. 
Richard, you're destined to stand before great men. Don't worry. So we went to the library, checked out a book on how to create a marketing strategy. And you know what I did? We copied it word for word. <laughs> So the day comes. You know, we didn't have technology, right? We had, remember the transparencies? So I made a bunch of copies. I went to a store, bought my first tie for $3.50. Had my neighbor fix it, so in the morning I just... <laughs> and here they come. The CEO himself. With every high-level executive in the PepsiCo organization. Didn't realize what I had done. So I started the presentation, word for word. And I was feeling it. I was feeling great. Then all of a sudden, a question comes up. You know, there's somebody always in the room to steal your destiny. <laughs> it was one of the highest marketing executives in the company. And he raised this, like, Yes, he says, well, Richard, because it was going so well. It was going too good. I said, well, Richard, just how much market share are we talking about? And I froze. The market share? We haven't read that chapter yet. <laughs> that little boy again when will I fit in I'm making a fool who do I think I am presenting to some of the most educated men and women of my organization but then I remember going into the stores you know we call them where the racks are we call them gondolas with the most ridiculous smile you would ever see I said oh this much market share <laughs> ridiculous is that? How much market share? This much market share. <laughs> you know what the CEO did? I didn't realize what I've done. But the CEO stood up. My grandfather said something to me that uh, I, I say is the reason I'm successful. And I love to tell young people this. You know, we've spoken at, at Harvard, Notre Dame, some of the top schools in the country. And I always say this. And, and he asked me, what are you going to do? I said, uh, I'm the janitor. I have to mop the floor. And he looked at me and he said, when you mop that floor, you make sure that it shines. So when people see it, they know that a mountain has mopped it. And my dad said, listen to your grandpa. You know, I actually took that on. And, and this is what I tell people. And, and, you know, maybe some people will get it in some way. I said, as much as I love the compensation, the promotions, Frito-Lay, Hot Cheetos, Pepsi, the truth is it was never about them. It was always about my last name. You know, it was always about that, you know, and uh, I'm mopping the best I could. And I saw that I was having an influence. And people say, how can you have an influence when you're just a janitor? And I told people, there's no such thing as just a janitor. When you believe in your heart, you're going to be the best. No such thing as a waiter, a bus driver. And what was happening was my job was to clean the bathrooms, the lunchroom, and all the... Uh, managers uh, offices before they came in in the morning so the workers would go into the bathroom and the bathroom was spotless it smelled good and they come out with a smile like hey who, who cleaned that and then they go into the lunchroom and it was you know spotless you know, I, you know i wasn't complaining like throw your own trash i was just cleaning and smell good and then in the morning the managers were you know, opening up their offices and saying wow who my office is spotless who you know who did this and everybody pointed to that janitor and said Richard Montanez. And that's when I learned that I, at, a, at a very young age that I had an influence. I could influence people without saying one word by my work ethics. I, I influenced, I put a smile on their face and never even said anything. And then I realized too, you know, some of these quotes, quote that are ancient, exactly that they're ancient. Somebody said, you get promoted by who you know. I said, that's not true. You get promoted by who knows you. You can say you know the CEO or the manager all you want, but if they don't know, and that's what was happening as a janitor, people were knowing 
who I was just because of my work ethic. I hadn't even spoken a word yet. Young students today um, don't have those abilities to sit down with, you know, I always say sit down with your grandpa. Now, maybe he wasn't CEO or something, but listen to her stories, his stories, whatever, because there's a wealth of information in there. They overcame. They were through some tough times, some generations that they have done some things. And I always find it fascinating when I can find someone who's older than me and wants to talk to me. I'll just sit there and listen to them. And, I just, and you never know. Somebody says, where do you get your ideas? I said, by listening to people. You know, people will say things and they don't even understand what they said. But I'm the type of individual, I'm a great listener. I can hear and I've made a fortune out of just listening to people. There isn't anything that you can't accomplish if you have vision. You see, when I started with Frito-Lay in 1976, I didn't have a whole lot of going for me. I had no education, was told I would never be anything, but I had one thing, I had vision. And this is what vision did for me. When others saw what I was, Vision saw what I would become. The very thing that disqualified me, Vision used to qualify me. Time manager called me up. You know, the probation period was, 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 uh, was actually 30 days. And 15 days had gone by and he said, uh, I got to let you go. And I can't tell. I, I mean, I didn't even have a hard time talking about it because it was so long ago. But what it did to me. I was just totally devastated. Like, you know, I, I blew the only shot that I would, somebody like myself, could you have to understand, you know, people say you don't make right choices when you're in the hood or ain't too many good choices coming to the hood. You know, it, it, I, I don't frown on anybody who's from that area. Cause that's where I come from. You know, I come from the ghetto. I, my leadership is from the hood. So I just thought, man, it ain't going to come again. And I blew it. You know, so I, I begged him like, man, you know, please, you know, let me, let me, you know, what did I do? Then he said, well, you know, you don't show any initiative. I didn't know what the word meant. And, and here, here's what he was saying is uh, he told me to mop this, this, this. And I did it so fast and so good that I was finishing too early. So I didn't know what to do. So guess what I did is I mopped it again. So I just, I just kept cleaning the same stuff within those eight hours, n knowing that I'd done it in four hours. But listen to this. No one had ever done it in four hours. So he said, you show no initiative. And I was, I didn't know what that meant. So I went I, and I begged him. I said, just give me two more weeks. I will be the most initiative person you ever see. Please, please. And, and uh, you know, it's part of my destiny. He said, okay, you got two weeks. So I went home. And Judy's been my teacher, my inspiration, you know. I said, Judy, I almost got far. And she said, what happened? And uh, I said, he said I didn't have any initiative. And I said, what is that? And then she began to explain to me, and it, uh, it hurt. I mean, it hurt inside. And, and it hurt so much that it took me over the edge. I ain't never going to hear that word again. No one's ever going to say that Richard has no initiative. I knew where I, where I was at at that time. I knew... There was racial discrimination everywhere, you know, not to point any fingers, but, you know, that, that was the 70s. You know, we just came out of the 60s. So I didn't have a whole lot of choices. You know, I quit school. I didn't have a high school diploma. You know, I just saw that, you know, uh, I was I'm a visionary. You know, and the problem with being a visionary is we're five to 10 years ahead of everyone else. You got to have patience. To let everybody else catch up. So I knew, um, you know, I wasn't going to get mad. I, I was hurt and broken because. Uh, it was the truth. It was the truth. I didn't have any initiative. And that's why I, I teach young people. Sometimes when somebody tells you the truth, you've got to learn not to be offended and use that because it is the truth. Even th there's a scripture in the Bible that Paul even wrote that I love. He said, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? You know, and, and today people can't take that. Well, I'm quitting. I'm you know, getting the hell out of here. You know, he can't talk to me like that. You know, sometimes I say, you know, don't get abused. But hang in there, you know, um, build something. And that's how I felt like I didn't have it. I wanted that job real bad. I, I wasn't going to quit just because, you know, it was true. I didn't have any initiative. So he didn't lie to me. He wasn't picking on me. He probably one of the best things that, that anybody could have ever said to me. I was uh, 
a young boy during the civil rights movement of the 60s. Now, what I like to tell people is that I wasn't old enough to have an impact on the movement, but I was old enough that the movement had an impact on me. And here's how the story goes. We're in a one-room one apartment, and my mom's getting me ready for school because I was being bused from my school to an all-English-speaking school across town. And I remember I'm crying because I don't want to go to school. My mom says, why not? And I said, because everybody speaks English. You know, it's not fair for me. I can't speak a word. This is before know. bilingual, no yeah, translators. And that's the other thing. I'm glad you brought that up. Is, is people forget is that, you know, during my days, there were no bilingual classes. If, if, if you wanted your license, you needed to know English. It was, it, was, it was pretty difficult. It was different. It was really different. And um, so my uncle takes me to the corner, and uh, here comes the yellow bus. And then there goes the yellow bus. So I'm kind of happy and telling my uncle, I guess they're not going to stop for us. There was about 10 of us waiting. Then all of a sudden we hear this big pop and bang and we see this green bus coming up the hill smoking. And um, that's the bus that uh, they sent for us. And I remember I told my uncle, it's just like it happened yesterday. And that's why I say sometimes you got to go back, you know, so you can catch some of those wisdom and some of the things that happened to you. So. Uh, I'm telling my uncle, why can't I ride the yellow bus like the other kids? And he has no explanation. I don't know. This is the bus that they sent for you. You know, Jeremy, it wasn't until I was an adult that I finally realized why they sent that green bus. And it was society at the time saying that this group of children, this t group of 10, they're not good enough to ride the yellow bus. Let's put them on a green bus, parade them across town so that the whole town can see that because of who they are, they're not good enough to ride. And as, and as, a, as a young boy, that, uh, I took that on because you have to understand, I didn't know what diversity was. I didn't know what discrimination was. I didn't know what race was. But one thing that I did know, and I knew my color. So for me, it was like, oh, dark skin is kind of like a second class citizen. And I, that's all I knew. So, oh. Okay, so I began to take that on. I'm not good enough for the yellow bus. So we get to school. I don't understand the word the teacher's saying, uh, but I always said this, that there's one sound that's international, that every child knows that sound, and that's the sound of the recess, recess bell. Recess, that's right. Or lunch. <laughs> lunch. So we, as a matter of fact, it was lunch. So it was uh, lunchtime, so it was all a relief. And, you know, my group, we got our lunches, and, you know, we sat outside, and uh, I pulled my lunch out. And I was getting ready to take a bite, and I put it back. I put it back because everybody in that whole uh, playground was staring at me. And the reason they were staring at me, because it was a burrito. And what people need to understand, that this was 1963, the world hadn't seen a burrito yet. Right. You know, contrary to popular belief, Taco Bell didn't introduce the burrito to the world. Me and my mom did. <laughs> but the fact is, I was embarrassed. Yeah. So I went home and I told my mom in Spanish, I said, you know, make me a bologna sandwich and a cupcake like the other kids because I don't want to be different. And I told my mom, why do I have to ride the green bus? Why do I have to be this color? Why do I have to speak this language? Why do I have to eat this food? I want to fit in like everyone else. But my mom, I've always said she's a marketing genius. She said, no, this is who you are. And that was Wednesday when I was bused to that school. So Wednesday was my burrito nightmare. Thursday, she made me two burritos, and she said, here's one for you, and here's one, one to share friends. with a friend. So I went to school, shared a burrito with a friend on Thursday. Friday, I was selling burritos for 25 cents a piece. And thus, the entrepreneurialism kicks in. That's when I realized that, even at a young age, that, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, there is something special about Different, being different. And I finally realized, Jeremy, that none of us were created to fit in. We were all created to stand out. And I think that's what we need to teach our young people is quit trying to fit in because it's never going to happen because you weren't created to fit in. You were created to stand out. So for me, that became a revelation that led to a revolution of my life. I knew that, okay, I'm different, but it's okay. And uh, I really started to fall in love with my culture and who I was. In life, um, all you need is one revelation mm -hmm. to create a revolution. Mm. And I didn't know that then, but I was about to get the biggest revelation of my life that was going to create the biggest revolution in my life, but the revolution in my company that was going to lead to a revolution 
in the industry. Mm -hmm. So I like to say, you know, uh, and I get excited wow. about this. I like to say that, yes, I changed corporate America. And people will say, you're so full of yourself. And I say, I am. Mm -hmm. You know, because I know what I did. And I think that's something that we have to teach young people, too. So I revolutionize how you see corporate America today. It's not the same it was 20, 30 years ago. I think when, you know, how I got that revelation is I was looking and I saw all these spices. And then I looked at our products and like, ah, we didn't really have a lot of spices. So that was a revelation. Create something with spices for those who enjoy, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody loves spices today. Yeah. You know, I mean... But uh, especially but time, being Latina, yeah, you especially enjoy it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, that's what we decided to do. And then again, here comes another revelation. I didn't know what to do. I just like, okay, I got to make something. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was, you know, what that would look like, what it would be. Right? But I'm sitting in my old house mm -hmm. and, you know, here comes the elote man. And I buy an elote and he puts the chile on it, the cheese and everything. This is the truth. Remember, one revelation. What is a revelation? Something that was always there, but it's been revealed to you. Mm -hmm. So I took a bite, and when I looked at it, it was like, this looks like a Cheeto. What if I put chili on a Cheeto? A crazy, ridiculous idea. What are you doing? Yeah. So I went and told my wife, hey, we got to make some some special chili. So I went to the plant and got some Cheetos with no cheese on it. Mm -hmm. Took them home and me and my wife, you know, we worked on a recipe. We tried this, we tried that. We finally got it down. She took some to work. I took some to work. Everybody loved it. Wow. I said, man, Richard, you got to call the CEO. This is great. Well, keep in mind, um, you don't call the CEO. Right. You know, I didn't know any better. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes you've got to be willing, you know, yeah. to do the things that, you're not sure of. Back in my days, you know, when I first started off, you know, me, you know, I, I've, I've been with my wife since we were kids. You know, we've been together 40 years. We've been married 35 years, been together 40 years. Um, you know, but when we got together, we didn't have any dreams. That's why I like to tell young people, you know what, dream, let it be wild. It's, it's okay. Throw it out there. See, my dad and my grandfather were good men, but they didn't know how to dream because all they were doing was working. So when I started working, I started working full time when I was in the third grade. My grandfather picked grapes, my dad picked grapes, then I picked grapes. So we didn't have time to dream, but we had hope. And our hope that someday we would have a better future. That someday, maybe someday, we don't have to worry about how we're gonna feed our kids today. Maybe someday we'll have a bank account. Maybe someday Judy and you and I will be able to write a check. Maybe someday we'll, we'll live in that neighborhood that we used to go trick-or-treating and they'd throw us out because they said, you don't live in this. But I remember, I didn't want to go trick-or-treating in the barrio. There was no candy in there. <laughs> Me and Judy used to go across town where you get the big, the big Hershey bars. But after a while, after a few knocks, they would realize, you know what, this is not your neighborhood, is it? Go back. We, we were never hurt. Because we didn't know what discrimination was. We didn't know what it was. We just, well, we don't belong there. We got to go back to the other side of the track. Young people, I want to tell you today, listen to me, young people. You don't need anybody's permission to become great. And if you feel you need somebody's permission, well, I'm here to give it to you today. You have my permission to be great. I turned it around. You know, I, I did my job in four hours. And I was on, uh, there, there was a wall that separated production from the offices and the lunchroom. Because in production, there was, you know, quality control. You couldn't go in there unless you had hairnets and, you know, protective equipment. Um, so what I did I, is I borrowed some protective equipment. And I went in there and I started hanging out with the operators the people that were running the lines, and I started taking their trash outside. Uh, and then uh, if they wanted, this is cool, this is the truth, I don't know, you know, people will like it, but if they wanted a, a cigarette break, you know, to go outside and smoke, you know, this is, this is 70, right? You know, everybody smokes. Uh, so I would say, well, just show me what to do. You know, you'll just be gone for five minutes. And they're like, uh, I don't know. Like, oh, come on, just, I'm, I'm a mechanic, you know, and I really am, you know. And uh, so they would teach me, you know, uh, 
how to watch the line and they would go outside, you know, and I'd do that for a couple of weeks. And so, so the other managers were, were telling my manager, like, Hey, uh, the guy on your crew that mops in the night, man. Hey, uh, I just want to thank you for letting him take my trash out. My guys helped him. And they were like, what, who did that? You know? And he was like, yeah. like, okay. He was like, no one had ever done that. You know, you heard the old statement. That's not my job. Oh, well, yes. after he told, after he told me that I, I, I never said, I said, I'm employed here. That is my job. You know, that is my job. And, and little by little, I learned how to run the, the Dorito lines. You know, how to, and, and it is, it is like being a pilot. It's not, you know, people say you just make chips. Oh, no, 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 man. It's just like you got to go to pilot school to learn how to make Doritos and potato chips and Fritos. Believe me, it takes a couple of years to be a master. It's always the doubters, you know, and I like to tell young people, you know, stay away from the haters, you know. And people said, well, what do you do? I said, I'm the janitor. Said, oh, you're the, you're just the janitor. And I said, you know what? There's no such thing as just a janitor. There's no such thing as just a way. There's no such thing as a, there's no such thing as just when you believe in your heart that you're going to be the best. And I believed in my heart and people were taking that. And I, that floor shine. I like who I am. I hope all of you love me, but if you don't, it's okay. You know why? Because I love me. <laughs> Young people fall in love with yourself because when you fall in love with yourself, there's a freedom to be yourself. If you want 10 more amazing rules from Richard, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. And I've made a fortune out of just listening to people. The very thing that disqualified me, vision used to qualify me. Sometimes when somebody tells you the truth, you've got to learn not to be offended and use that.